So hello and welcome to those of you who are listening to this session today and that will include friends and family as well as those of you who have macular disease. My name is Suzanne Roberts and I'm head of the counselling service at the Macular Society and today we're going to speak about how you might seek support in talking to someone who matters to you about your eye condition. So I will be speaking to you briefly to give you an overview of what we have learned from the clients that use our counselling service. And then we'll hear from a service user, Diana, who has wet macular disease and she's kindly agreed to share her experience with us today. So receiving a diagnosis of macular disease can have a huge emotional and practical impact on every area of your life and this the level of impact will depend on another um, a number of factors and this could be sort of the amount of useful vision that you do have whether or not you're having treatment going forward the support that you have around you and your general health and well-being right we know through our counseling service that talking to someone can make a, a real difference and when it comes to talking about our feelings some of us will be more comfortable than others in in doing this yet when we do feel listened to and when we feel understood it can mean a huge amount and I've got a quote from a, a previous client, and this has been said on a number of occasions. What's the point in me talking about my eyes? It won't change anything. And no, it's not going to change the diagnosis, but it might help to sort of shift your perspective on your circumstances. And it might help to make you feel more confident, in control, and perhaps less overwhelmed. So a diagnosis of macular disease can impact on the dynamics within families and friendships and relationships in general. And I'm going to read out some quotes from um, the work that we've done with sort of friends and family. So the people that, that we work with that have somebody in their family basically that has macular disease. So the first one is, I'm not sure if I'm talking about eyes too much or not enough I don't want to cause any upset so there's a hesitancy to sort of raise the topic I feel helpless there's nothing I can do it's hard to see them struggling with something and I'm not sure what I should be helping with so it can be really hard for the person with macular disease but also those people that are living with that person or associated with that person, so the friends and family, etc. So adjusting to sight loss can be a steep learning curve for the person themselves and also those around them. And we know that roles may change, such as you know, roles within the household in terms of who does the driving, who does the paperwork, and another roles may change within within the household adaptations may need to be made and this could be at home or in the working environment and the person with macular disease may feel at times quite angry quite frustrated and also the, pe the people around them may feel some of this too as often a diagnosis will bring about a change that wasn't envisaged as can also be the case when there's been a dip in vision. So let's think about the people sort of close to you and the people that you're likely to speak to about your diagnosis. And this could be a new diagnosis or it could be um, that there's been a, a change in the level of vision. So the level of vision has, has reduced and had an impact on that person. So it could be partner that you live with partner husband wife whoever that might be um, and you might think this is this is obvious but but not always because you might be in a relationship where perhaps talking about how you feel might make you feel uncomfortable it may make the other person feel uncomfortable and this might be quite a difficult conversation so something that perhaps is approached very sort of slowly 
with both parties acknowledging that perhaps it's not going to be easy. And then, of course, friends. So being able to sort of pick a friend who you can trust or perhaps someone where perhaps you support each other or have done so over the years. And then there's the wider family. So for those of you who are fortunate enough to have family that you're in regular contact with, could you say more about your vision and its impact on your life? You know, is there a family member who perhaps you get on particularly well with? Or again, someone who, you know, you trust and somebody who is approachable. So what are the potential benefits in for you to, you know, in terms of you speaking about how you feel and what you're experiencing, what are the potential benefits? It could be that you feel that others understand you a lot better. It could also help to clear up any confusion around assumptions that people make. And this could be what you can and can't see, why your level of vision can change depending on the lighting, if you're inside or, or if you're outside. Or if you've been outside and it's very bright and then you've gone into a shop that's perhaps dimly lit or vice versa. It can also be um, sort of explaining what you need help with and also what you want to do independently. And you may feel less alone with some of the challenges that you face. You could feel stronger and more empowered. And if you choose, it could be the start of a much bigger conversation. So all of the above may improve sort of understanding within relationships with those people that matter to you. So for many people, there are and will be sort of barriers to talking about how you're feeling. And these come up on a regular basis with our counselling clients. So common themes are protecting others. So quite often I will hear people say, um, my friends, my family, they're too busy, they have enough problems of their own and I don't want to burden them. It generally, if you ask someone what a friend or a family member would say if you said that you'd been struggling for some time and not said anything, Normally, the answer would be that they would say, why haven't you told me sooner? So people will always be busy and sometimes it is a case of making time for that conversation. And then something that goes much deeper is around sort of personal identity and assuming others will see or, or think of you differently or perhaps not wanting to feel different or acknowledge difference within oneself. So really around not wanting to feel vulnerable. And some people may feel that speaking about their eyes or speaking about how they're coping may make it too real and something that they're not ready to do. Um, again, something that's mentioned on a regular basis is not wanting sympathy not wanting others to feel sorry for you. And there are some people that are so used to dealing with things alone that they choose, in their words, to get on with it and they choose not to reach out to others. And I suppose we must respect that everybody has their own individual way of coping and what works for them. There's also the case of, of timing. So if you are going to talk about how you're feeling or, or what's happening, etc., cetera, um, it might be, be a case of sort of thinking, when will be a good time to do that? Are you or the other person you plan to speak to better at certain times of the day? Where would be the best sort of environment to have that conversation? Would that be at home? Would it be someone neutral or, or once travelling? You know, when when is you, when are you or the person that you plan to speak to less distracted and available to you? So tips for better communication. I'd say try and keep that line of communication open, however small and in whatever form. So this might be just sitting together 
It could be that you have a hug. It could be a very short phone call. It doesn't always have to be a long, sort of deep conversation. And if it's something that you want to do, you consider it, you consider it as just making a start. And sort of advice for friends and family that sometimes it's a case of just listening and perhaps reinforcing that you're in this together. Because often when we're thrown into a situation which is considered the unknown, such as a diagnosis of macular disease, we can go into action mode. That could be the person themselves, or it could also be the family or, or the friends. And this can be very helpful doing research, finding gadgets, etc. But sometimes it might be enough for you just to be there. And it might be that that person is at the stage where all they can do right now is to be able to absorb what's happening before they can sort of move on to that sort of action phase. And always check things out. Don't assume things. Check out what that person wants, what that person needs. And remember that at the Macular Society, you can always talk to us. Um, as well as your sort of local site support services, you know, we have an advice and information line which offers fan fantastic advice on everything linked to macular disease and also our other services. And the telephone number for our advice line is 0300 30 30 111. We also have our telephone counselling service, which is a free confidential service that you can refer yourself to via the advice line or via an online referral. And we have two other groups I'll just quickly mention. One is a telephone group for people who experience Charles Bonnet hallucinations. And the other group is a group that runs on Zoom and it's an employment therapy group so come come back to to us if you need support or you need advice of, of any kind so what we're going to do now is to introduce you to diana who's going to tell us about her experience of sharing how she was feeling and the difference that that's made to her thank you okay so thank you to diana for joining us today I know our listeners will be really keen to hear about your experience of macular disease and what a difference it's made to you, sort of sharing how you feel within your family. Would you mind by just sort of telling us a little, little bit about when you were diagnosed and the treatment that you've had so far, just so that um, our listeners have got some kind of sort of understanding of where you're at? Yes, hi Suzanne. Oh. I developed macular, uh, wet macular in both eyes only three months ago, so it's been quite overwhelming in that my life has literally changed overnight from being an independent person, living on my own, which I do, um, traveling around busy as everybody else. And um, actually, I, I was driving at the time, and one of my eye I just had a bleed in my eye. Um, I had mentioned one night having in the other eye and I have having injections every few months which we hope will um, steady down um, the the macular getting worse. Uh -huh. um, medically I've had absolutely fantastic treatment. Mentally it has not been so easy. Um, I'm the sort of person that thought yes I can cope, I can deal with this, um, I've always dealt with things but you come to a stage where you realise you do need help. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and you said that in the past you might have flagged up to your family that there was a problem, but you kind of would always get through it. Yes. What others didn't know this time round was that you hadn't sort of found a coping mechanism, so it sounded very different to the challenge yes. you'd had previously. Yes, that was quite right. I would, um, of course, my family are, are very sympathetic and they, they tried to help me, but they didn't know what to do. And it's very difficult to ask for help when you think you can 
sort yourself out. Yes, there are lots of gadgets out there you can find, but you don't realise what it takes uh, its toll, basically, on your mental health. Mm -hmm. and I reached out and um, to the Macler Society, and I, after several chats, I realised that it would be better if I shared mm -hmm. how much feeling with my family and friends. Um, this is always difficult to do when you're quite a private person and you feel it very difficult to talk. Yeah. I found that the timing was um, very important. You can't just blurt these things out and you have to sort of say a little thing because other people don't really know how to help you. And no. so, as you were saying uh, previously, they, they're not sure what to do. Um, they can rush in with AIDS and um, put up more lights or change things for you. But that's not always the help you want immediately. It's just becoming acclimatised to a new way of life, a new way of coping. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm, I'm fi I am coping, but I am finding that difficult, as I'm sure many other people are. Yeah, sure. And, and it was your daughter that you you spoke to and I remember sort of saying to you that um you know why why was it that you sort of hadn't mentioned something sooner and you said well I'm the mum that's right you no know, I'm yeah. there to support her it shouldn't be the yeah. other way around yeah and that we had a sort of think about the ways in which you do actually support your daughter yes yes but you don't think about it at the time you you think I'm the mum I'm the grandma I'm the one everybody comes to I'm the one that's always got the answers um, and you can't, you, as you um, explained to me, you can help in other ways. But you may not be able to help in the way you used to, but there are still ways of supporting as you used to. Yes, exactly. And what do you think some of the sort of barriers were to um, to sharing or, just, you know, your sort of hesitancy? I know about being mum. Was there anything yeah, else? Well, I, I think I felt embarrassed, really embarrassed that I, I couldn't cope um, because usually I, I'm, well, I think as most people feel, they, they it's just, you know, stuff off a lip, you can cope with this, you can get round things, but sometimes, because um, sight loss is a, a big thing and it's the one disability that other people literally can't see. So I would be in a crowd of people um, or at a meeting or something and somebody would be talking and I realised that I can't see the screen and um, I can't recognise my friends and that makes you well it's um, yes it's quite it can be quite stressful and you have to sort of think of it in a, in a different way you know and you said um, previously that you felt that others wouldn't understand if you yes. just decide to speak about it yes Yes, you feel many feel like that. Uh, not not now, but some people. Um, I think many people don't really understand what macular is, mm -hmm. and you can. They say, "Oh, how are you?" And you say, "Oh, I've had got macular in my eye, or I've had a macular bleed." And then they say, "Oh, is it better now? Has is it cured?" Mm. And it's quite difficult to because because you're not falling over because you can walk along and yeah. and see that you can go around obstacles. They think they can't understand that you can't actually see their face. And we all, when we talk to people, we go by body language and yeah. reaction. And so when they're talking to someone, you can't gauge what the other person's thinking. Or, or, so it's a whole different way. It's learning a whole different way of communication. Um, by feeling tips. Yeah, and I'm being an invisible disability. Absolutely, yes, it is an invisible disability. And, um, you know, I, when I'm in a group of people, I tend to chat and, and with people. And but you miss, you miss that feedback from other people's expressions. Mm, that you're not able to sort of... Yes, on. yes. And, and something that you mentioned as well, Diana, that was really important was you said that perhaps the stronger and, and the sort of the stronger and the sort of tougher you are, yes. perhaps the harder you might find it. Absolutely. To share and say that something's not quite right. That's right. And I think I would say that if you fail in trying to cope, cope it, it's it's you know, it's it's no it's not a failure not being able to cope. Um, and I think I have found comfort and strength to move forward by reaching out 
and asking for help. It's helped me cope tremendously. Mm. I think I, I really like the phrase that you used. And you said, I've always been someone who's perceived as having coped. That's right. Yes. You haven't failed because you haven't coped. That's quite right. Yes. 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 Okay. And there'll be people that are, are listening now. You'll be finding life with macular disease sort of really hard for a number of reasons. What sort of advice would you give to them around reaching out? And also, I suppose, getting the most out of life generally. And I appreciate everybody will be different. Yes. But just sort of from your perspective. Well, I think you have to find what works for you. Um, everybody, everybody, as you say, everybody is different. Um I've I've found um, audible books, for instance, talking books, um, and I've, I've I'm learning to use Siri. Fantastically, <laughs> my my age group we're not that computer literate, unfortunately. But um, I am using learning to use technology to a certain extent to help me in in what I want to achieve, um, which is is absolutely uh, brilliant. And um, yes. And do you think that, again, this is a question that comes up and I don't think there is an answer. I think somebody said to me, you know, how do you sort of accept the, the macular disease? How do you accept it? I'm not sure if anybody 100% accepts it, but I don't know. What would you say to that? I think um, having sight loss is a grieving process because you're grieving from all sight. Um, and I think... When you come to terms with your own reduce your sickness, you can be you feel more comfortable and you can move forward. Um, but it's not something that you can some people may be able to, but personally I, I find it's not something you can just do overnight. It's not just but you know, it's something that's gonna be there. You, know, you learn to cope with it and there are many other things out there, but you have to be patient with yourself. And giving itself time to accept doing the new things out there. And why does it stop people to get mad here? It's just a different life. Mm. Thank you. That's fantastic. So, as we sort of bring our session to an end, I'd like to thank you, Diana, for sharing your personal story so eloquently <laughs> and also your wisdom. <laughs> I'm sure in, in doing this, you would have inspired many. Uh, and giving many people hope as well. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. You're welcome.